In the year 2005, I started my KCP and I passed 12 with 406 out of the possible 500 marks. So my, my parents wanted me to join Karima Girls, which was near my home area. But at the back of my mind, I felt like, no, I should not have joined that one. I should be in a better school, of which I had admissions for all the schools, but the girls, Karima and Nevasha girls. But my dad, being the teacher that he was, could, not, could hear none of it. So we disagreed a little bit, but he told me to go to Karima girls under one condition. He is going to transfer me if I give him the best performance, and I did. After the possible back then, 132 points, the least I ever took home was a 129, which was a straight A. First term, second term. And that time, dad is not acting. He's actually comfortable with what, what I'm taking home. So he felt like if I can get that, so there's, there was no problem for him. But deep down my heart, I still remember this promise that he's going to take me to a better school, the school of my choice. So... I never settled in school. I was still waiting for his action. Come second term, things took a drastic change. Here I am, an, ad an adolescent, trying to find identity. I still rely on my parents' promise, and they also want to have my voice heard. So at first term, I just became this. I just became this bad girl in school. I could not hear my teachers fighting, and that earned me a first suspension and a second one, that was in first term. In second term, I had my third suspension, and the fourth one, I was given an expulsion. So when I got back home, my mom was so mad with me. In the process, I also ran away from home, and I went and joined my sister, I was living in Embo back then, and being my elder sister, uh, she could just not stomach me anyway. So trying to bring me back home, it didn't work. I just ran away from home, went and started roaming about in the streets of Embo town. And uh, that's where I met a certain guy. He just saw me in the streets. He was a colleague to my sister at a certain, at a certain bank in Embo. And uh, he, pay, he just looked at me and then, Beatrice, what are you doing here? I give him my story and I don't know whether he sympathized with me or empathized with me, but he took me in, something that I really needed so badly. I needed shelter, I needed food, I needed something to just make life a little bit bearable. And he offered that, and that is how we got married. I got into his house, he gave me a change of clothes, he provided food, and uh, in the process he started sleeping with me. At a tender age, I didn't know anything about contraceptives or any way that I could have prevented myself. I go and uh, I was pregnant with no time. My sister moved from Embu to Nairobi and left us in Embu. So this guy, he, he started abusing me physically. He would just go, come home drunk, he would beat me up, but I had nowhere to go. I could not go back home. Because now this time around, I'm heavy, I'm pregnant. So how do I even go and start explaining to my parents, like, I ran away from home, but here yeah, I am pregnant. To me, it, okay, it was a very a difficult life for me. I did not know how to go about it. So I opted to stay with the guy. When I was about eight months pregnant, the guy moved, had a transfer and was moved to Nairobi, and we moved together. So uh, at this particular day, he was invited for a birthday party by his brother. Uh, his nephew was having a birthday and they converged there as a family. And uh, back home, I was so unwell. So we kept in communication. I would tell him I'm not so well. And uh, he would promise me he's coming back home. So at, at around midday, he sent me some cash. And he requested for the same, I refund, and I sent him back via M-Pesa. Uh, in the evening, we communicated and just kept promising, I'm coming to take you to the hospital. I'm coming to take you to the hospital. So when he came back home, he was so drunk. He demanded for food. I did not have food. 
I had not cooked. I did not even have the strength even to make the food, the supper that he was demanding for. So we had a confrontation and uh, one thing led to another and it became just bad, messy. Um, I was first of all received the first stab, which is around here. And uh, some around two of them on my left side. In my defense, I took the very same knife and stabbed him back. Unfortunately, he bled so much since he was drunk. And at this time, I was calling out our neighbors to come and help me. And uh, the caretaker of the plot that I was living in came uh, just to the mess that we had created in the house and ran to call the sister. When the sister came, she just looked at us. I was, I was bleeding, he's bleeding. So the first thing the sisters did was they took the guy to the hospital. And uh, at that time, I remember the police had been informed and there was a patrol vehicle that was around. I was picked by the police from Buruburu Police Station and they are the ones who took me to Makadara. So I went, uh, I was given first aid, I was stitched, and then I was taken back to the cells. It was so unfortunate, really unfortunate that after two days of the incident, the guy lost his life. And uh, I was charged with his murder. Uh, it pains me to know that he lost his life in my arms. It breaks my heart every time I look at my son today. Looked at, look at him and I know he will never have that chance to meet his biological dad. It is hurting. It is painful. But I had to collect myself and just face what was now ahead of me. So after 11 days uh, at the police station, I was taken to court. I, I, was, facing, uh, I was charged with murder and I pleaded not guilty. Uh, since I was underage, and I was heavily pregnant by that time, so I could not have been taken to a juvenile pr uh, prison, so they opted to take me to Langata Women's Prison, after uh, where I stayed for about tw two weeks. On the third week, I delivered my baby boy. I stayed with him there for around 13 months, and it is a difficult life being in prison and also having a young one. You'd not have the necessary, you'd not have so, you miss out on so much from feeding to social life, to social development of the child or even to yourself. Because like for myself, when I go to Langata, stations that I, the station that I got there forced me to mature up. I had to know to act the adult that I was not. I did not have even the proper diet. My son was not breastfeeding well. I had no milk. Breast milk was so minimal. The production was so minimal due to poor diet. And even the place that you were put in, oh my God, it was just too dangerous. I realize now, but God kept us safe. The room, uh, we were isolated from other, pre uh, other remandies and other prisoners, so that at least for about three months, we could have a time, we and our children. But so it was so unfortunate that where we were, just the next door, the next room were TB patients. So you can get the irony of the next room is our newborn babies and the next room are TB patients. So, but I thank God, not even a single baby ever suffered. You couldn't imagine the life we as parents envision for our children and seeing your child starting on such, it breaks a parent's heart, it broke my heart. I didn't personally. I did not know how I'm going. I'm no. I'm, how was I even to bring up the baby? Being the last born, I had not seen. I, I did not have an experience how babies are taken care of. But through God's grace, we made it. So when my son was around uh, 13 months, something came up in the prisons, and uh, as a punishment that you had going from the authorities was the canteen was shut down. So that meant that I could not access uh, supplementary supplementary feeds for my son. I could not get even a packet of milk for him. I could not have. I couldn't get anything to supplement the budget that the prison offered. So I just called my mom through the officer of the welfare, and she came and picked my son, and went back home. So I was left all alone in the prison. 
to handle it all. Uh, when you got into prison, the first days you are just in denial. You do, you are trying so much. You are really struggling with the what ifs. What if I let him be? What if I run away? So you are so much in denial. Then it hits you hard. There is nothing that you could have done. However, due to the open policy that uh, the Kenya prisons have offered, there are several foundations that get into there. And uh, I was lucky to get a counselor who I talked to and helped me to somehow accept the situation. Actually, when I got into prison, I did not even know the magnitude of what I was facing. I did not understand. I have been charged with murder. How now? I, did not, I could not even get it. But once I got there, I got some legal experts there, and they broke down to me what I was really about to face. And it just shattered my heart to know that a death sentence was just staring at me any time. Uh, being in remand is so hard because you do not know. You are in this place that uh, Rita, you are between a, a rock and a hard place. And especially being a capital remand, knowing very well what is staring at you is a death sentence, life imprisonment. And uh, at times it would even go crazy and they give you like 40 years. Uh, so being there, it, it was an, a, a mixed reaction that you'd face because it, was not, it is not easy living with uncertainties. You don't know how your tomorrow is going to be. You know, it's even better for those who are convicted already because they know that even after that years, after that years, they'll go home if God gives you the grace to survive. But here you are, you don't know even the judge how he's going to tell you. At times you, you are inexperienced. You go to court, you just listen to the witnesses, how they say it, and you feel like, oh God, things are just not so good with me. It was a difficult moment bearing in mind that you don't know what is the, the outcome. It's just so hidden. A capital remand is someone who, the, I think in Kenya, they are, it's someone who is punishable by death. That is either murder cases, robbery with violence, that is what they used to call stroke too, or someone who has committed treason. Those are the people who are punishable by death in Kenya. So the, we, were, we, were, we were put separate. So you can imagine the, the place we were, we were considered the hard cause. The more, the, we were more of criminals than the other criminals. Because here we are, it's either you're a murderer or a robber. The others, any other case, uh, the, any other case apart from the two, they are considered as the ordinaries. For one, capital remedies are not allowed to uh, to mix with the ordinary remedies unless on special occasions such as maybe you are attending the church, you are going to the shop, or there is something. Okay, there is any other function there within the prisons that is taking place, that's the only time that you're allowed to mix. And uh, even on, uh, on matters guard, capital remandies used to be guarded highly other than the others. For instance, when you're going to the hospital, uh, other remandies would get maybe just a word dress or even two. But for a capital remandy to be taken to the hospital, you had to be escorted by one. For one, you had to be escorted by not just by the juniors, but they had to be someone of a higher rank from the corporal upwards. They had to escort you. And this warden must be armed with a gun. So you can imagine the intensity of a capital remand. Then we have different uniforms from the rest. It will portray doom, something so boring, something which is not so good. At times it was, it, at times it was so bad to hear people, you know, having people that I once knew, because the, most of the people who were testified against me were relatives to the deceased. It's not a good scene to have people that you once knew, once shared a meal with. Now they are there talking so bad against you, giving incriminating evidence against you. It was it was not a sight to behold. Uh, luckily, it went. Uh, it was not, uh, and murder cases take quite long in Kenya. Uh, first of all, they give time for those witnesses. I, w I was made to understand that at times they delay. Because uh, they, they, are, uh, they delay them in a way to give time for the believed family and they are also the witnesses to, to have this time to cool down, not to come with all the tempers and everything. So they tactically delay them. 
So once the case begins, it takes also quite some time because we all might get a single case having more than 10 witnesses. Like in my own case, I think my case had 12 witnesses and they had to testify. And you know, a witness can even go for like two, three hours because they have to be cross-examined by your defense lawyer, uh, by the prosecuting counsel. So it, it was just a rigorous uh, time. And uh, I remember at, at a specific time, I suffered a big blow. When the judge was handling my case, got a promotion to the Court of Appeal, and uh, that one meant that he had to create time to come and listen to our cases. And I thank God for him because he took, uh, he took it upon himself. The cases that had not, uh, had not advanced, he shared them among the high court, other high court judges. But the cases that were quite advanced, he still had their files, and uh, he would create time and come to listen to us. Uh, the people who came to testify against me, they really relied on hard, hard, hard and over information. They would just come and tell, uh, say that I was told this is what happened, and uh, I was called, and uh, others would say like we spent the day with him, they kept in communication, and I would say that that saved me a great deal. The fact that we were in communication with him throughout the day, not even a single time did we argue with him, not even a single moment did we threaten each other. That thing saved me a great deal because it proved beyond reasonable doubt that I had no mens rea. The mens rea is this, I had no, no premeditated, I had, no, I had not premeditated his murder. I had not even a single moment thought that I was going to hurt him. It was never brought out in court and that is what saved me. That is what actually the judge used to set me free that whatever they said, our communication throughout the day proved that I had no anything, I had no, I had nothing against him. We communicated, would say, I was sent money, I sent, back, I sent him back the money when he requested. You see, that by itself proved that I had, I had no this premeditation to hurt him. So it felt bad when this boy would come and say, she's the one who killed him, you know. It would, it would tear me down because at the end of the day, I was also in the verge of losing my life too and that of my own, my unborn baby. But I had no that chance. I had not been given the chance to tell my own story, my own account of the story. So I just had everything. Things, you know, it's not easy. People here just coming, they are talking so bad about you, uh, pointing fingers at you. And of course, I understand their pain. They were bitter. They had lost their loved one. So I feel them, I understand them, I understand their heart. But at the end of the day, you also had to feel like, oh, you had, you had, I had to fight back. I had to tell them this is not really what happened. I had to create my own, I had to bring out the actual picture of what happened. You know, when you are put in such a station and your freedom is definitely taken away from you, you know, you are just there. So personally, I was so bitter with everything. I was bitter even with my own life. Because here I am, I, I ran away from home because I felt like what I wanted, I had not been given. I had not been given that chance to talk and just be heard. To talk. Uh, so I was just bitter with my parents back home. I was bitter with my siblings because they're not even helping. Help, they're not helpful in making my parents understand what I really want. I'm also bitter with this guy because how would he just take me in, yeah, turn me into a wife that I was not even ready for, I was, you see, those are the things that really, uh, they accumulated bitterness. So at times I felt like I had this urge to revenge, to get back and just do something weird to them, anybody that caused me pain back then. But, you know, those are the, those are the initial days that you are, you are still there. The pain is so fresh. The reality is now sinking in that, you know, you're here, you, you killed a person. And these people are just, they are, there's no one who is, you, you have no that chance to tell them what really happened. So you feel that, that anger. But luckily enough, I was able to get a counselor. Uh, we were taught how to step out of denial into reality, into, the, into sanity. You are now equipped on how, now how you're going to handle your current situation. I think that is the thing that changed my life and changed the decisions that I had made earlier. As a reminder, you have not specific duties. 
you are you just wake up take a bath if you are willing yeah just change your clothes if you have an extra one just eat and that is it you are not even allowed to wash the dishes those mororo things that you are using you are you, you are eating from we could not even wash so it is we just take them we just eat take them back to the ordinary mandis they would wash and then the convicted prisoners would come for them and go serve the food we were allowed to have our relatives visitors at different times and uh, about how okay you just speak um, in between you couldn't sit down and talk one on one You'd, there were those at uh, the visiting bay, there was a mirror. At first, there were a wire mesh so thick that you could not even see who, who the person you're talking to. But they brought in a mirror and uh, a pen. That is where they would, uh, they would just go talk. It, it had small holes just to allow the voice to pass. But there was nothing much that you could do beyond that. So they would just, by the, uh, the relatives or the people, your friends, they would come bring you they would bring you like the sanitary towels the toiletries that you need if you have a baby they would bring something for the baby though not edible they would bring now the diapers clothes those are the things that they would bring for you back then you would be given a, a duration of 1 to 55 minutes you, you at, at most if you are lucky enough if there are no people if there are no people you are given a maximum of 10 minutes to talk you know, for me, I think I was somehow naive because they only to give my time to give my defense. I really cried in that court. To an extent, the judge would tell the the prosecuting counsel, "Hold on, let her gain her, let her, let, let her just balance herself, and she can talk." So I give my own account, and uh, the day it was it was tough. Because you have to begin from where it all started to the time now that it made him lose his life. So I was put on my uh, after the defense. Now it is the judgment. Now, uh, now this is where you just like you can't even eat, you can't do anything. Uh, the suspense, yeah, the illusions. Uh, to give, I think even that time can even hallucinate because this is the final stage of your case. This is the determining factor. This is where they are going to determine how the next stage, uh, the next step you're going to take your life. So I remember the first time I went there and I felt like, uh, okay, I had nothing. I had not even prepared in any way. I went there and uh, the judge told me that the, uh, he has not, uh, he was not through compiling the judgment. And uh, I was taken back for further 14 days. And I remember when going now for the judgment, the second time, call it faith. That mom, that morning I woke up, I was just bubbling. Everything I had in that cell, I shared it among my cellmates. I gave everything out. The territories that I had, the sleepers, everything that would have been called by, na by my name. And that is how I went in court, armed with nothing else but faith. And my God honored that faith. I was set free. At around 10 a.m., 9th of November, 2011, I was free again. So it was like I felt like he had been born again. Regaining my freedom was, oh my God, I don't even know how to put it because it was, part, it was the beginning of another chance. Uh, when I walked into the courtroom, I could not even hold myself. I removed even the shoes so that I can just support. I could not even hold myself. I was so anxious. I did not even know what the judge is going to tell me. So he just uh, looked at the courtroom, greeted us, and uh, he told us, he told me that uh, he's not going to read through my judgment, all of it. And uh, he perished so many pages and started now reading the judgment. I didn't, most of it was just, it just passed. I could not even hear much of it. I just waited for his final words. But all I remember is that he looked at me and asked me, how old is your son? I told him he's three years now. And he told me, he just did casually. And I therefore put you at liberty. And I am Toto Wako. Well, the next thing I remember was just screaming. 
dad do not leave me here my dad was in the courtroom so i think all the other words or anything that took place at that moment i don't even remember i just cried so hard i really cried so hard no it was now the beginning of another chapter but at that moment i did not figure out that it out how it was going to be but i just felt reborn the fact that i was just not going to sleep in those cells i'll not have to wake up in the morning for the head count that that by itself was just big another chance a good given chance and i prayed to god to help me utilize it i may have lost those ears but i prayed to god and just asked to god to help me recapture them in one way or another there was this lady she works for faraja foundation she's christine odero she was the, she was in the resource center as well. she was manning the resource center as well as the library so she's on where this class of celebrate recovery africa we boarded so well from my initial days uh, i remember i would go and uh, i don't know whether she spotted someone bright or what it was but you no know, she coached me into you now teaching after i was through with my classes and she evaluated me and she felt like I'd healed you no know, she coached me that in her absence I would take I would take over the classes and teach the rest of the remandees and I know it helped people and especially in forgiving ourselves and letting go of the bitterness that is one thing I can celebrate and just say uh Christina so she has journeyed with me in everything I did because even after I left prison she never let me go she has been someone who's so supportive someone that I I do call up to date when I'm in need of good counsel She's my prayer partner too and uh journey with her from the days of my teens until now that you're grown up mothers it really it she's really a person that I hold so close to my heart I owe my healing process to her I owe my changing my change of perception about life in prison to her through Faraja Foundation living milimani lokot I think that is some that's the building that I ever walked so fast away from and deep down my head i was even promising myself be to walk faster just be faster because i did not want those people to change their mind and just bring me back there so we just left there in company of my some of my relatives my dad was there my mom could not make it she was in well back home and she was also with my son i remember getting now back coming to town nairobi it had changed i felt like oh you see the way that you can just catch a bird and just let it free that is how i felt now i'm here in the wild yeah i'm walking i'm crossing the streets and i remember i think i was walking so fast because at, a, at an instance i remember i fell down in town i don't know whether i was walking so fast or the excitement of uh, I, i was just lost in my own world small world i was getting back home so that day, receiving calls from all over my relatives oh she has been freed they couldn't believe so they were like Why is she a happy and I would speak over the phone you know also that excitement of talking over the phone without looking eh? right right and center and who is watching you so it is also, it felt so good getting back home enjoying the delicacies yeah looking forward now to like at that day I was just, I just, I think that is an example of a day that I can say I lived that day at that time I never be, I never even thought of the day after I just lived that very same day that I'm free now. I have put my freedom. That I I lived that particular moment for some time enjoying the freedom before I could now sit down like no after I'm free what else? Uh, and people knew that I would get home about this to lag. I used to get home at about 4 p.m. So people from all over they wanted to come and see for themselves. because like what they expected i don't know i don't know really what they had in mind of an ex prisoner or someone who had been in prison they really wanted to see this underfed malnutritioned person uh, they were looking forward to seeing this person with any somebody who was just looking bad but when i got home who and them I did not see the person that they wanted. They did not see really the person, the picture they had of me in mind. That's not what they got. So I just went there. I did not even have time to greet them all. There were so many. So I just went and just went to straight home. 
some were good enough, they followed me home. They just came and said hi. And uh, of course, there are those jabs that you'd hear. Like a certain mama just came and told her, uh, she was a friend of my mom, and just came and told us that, hey, uh, you know, like, if you may put it, uh, end quote, that is, they thought they would give me things like stinging net. You know, stinging net is generally nutritious and it helps somebody regain really fast. So they thought that is going to be good to feed me fast. One to them, I do not need it. Uh, some of my cousins would come and say, Guy, you know, we expected you would come and help her. You would come and just help Auntie to cook for you. You're even the one who's going to cook for us because actually I looked better than they were. So that shock on their faces was like really, you no, know, it started dawning on them. Was she, was she really in prison or what was it? So let's, you know, I was now put on a balance. Let's see how she's going to pick up her life. And that, no, that when I got home, that is now, the reality hit me. So now I'm no longer the 16 year old uh, that I got into prison. Here I am, almost 20. I get home, uh, I know the reality hits me like these people are really struggling. I had retired really like, my dad he was a P1 teacher. He was already retired. He retired when I was in class eight. So there was no income. My mom was forced to close down her shop because of the issues that really were in a meeting from the society. The, the words, the people used to speak just to her face, they were so hurtful and she couldn't take it anymore. So she just had to close down the shop and just get back home to farming. So in paying that legal fee for those three years, it must have cost them an arm and a leg because things at home were totally different. This is where you hear them say, kwa ground vitu zilikuwa tofauti. Really different. Because I could observe and I would see, and uh, I had this desire to go back to school and I would think like that dream was, it would, it would not have been realized if I read really on my parents. So my dad relied on a few friends, he would call them, whom he knew that there were teachers, he would call them and ask them like, uh, can my daughter get a vacance? And some of them were so good, good and blatantly honest and they would tell him no because of her past, she cannot get admission into our school. I know the principal will not allow her I was rejected in, few, in several schools and, and until one father who my mom called and uh, he agreed to talk to a certain principal. He shared my story with the principal. My mom was also called to the school. She shared her own experience and gave my her own account as a parent and she explained to her why I was not in school for four years. And uh, I made a everything. She was gracious enough that gave me an admission in her school. She, she believed in me somehow and felt that I should, uh, she, I don't know, just miraculously, she gave me a chance. And uh, that is where I was now. I, actually, in my village, I never faced a stigma, but in school, that is where I got the total bullying and the stigma that comes by when you are trying to reintegrate yourself back to the community. I think serving a sentence for those who are convicted is one different thing. Uh, being in remand and uh, having your case heard is another different thing. Reintegrating yourself back to the society, I think it's even difficult than serving the sentence. Because here, back here in the society, you are so, trying so hard, striving to prove to the society that you are a changed person. You know, this very same person that went to the prison, you are reformed. Uh, you are also carrying the burden, like, you know, they will not, they even label you, like, they, they, uh, they would even tell you, you know, when they're referring to you, they associate you with prison. Eh, you le bit with my alikuwa jela, kwa unikule. Uy niya mama ya yule mstiana mwenye alikuwa jela. Uy ni brother yule mstiana mwenye alikuwa jela. You know, that is how the society view you. And you are a suspect in everything. Yeah, you, you've come back. You are, you are a lady, you've come back to the society. You, are, you have nowhere to begin with. For the, the guys around you, they, really, they are there waiting to take advantage of you. 
because they, they feel that you've come back in desperation. The guys around there, they are there waiting for a very slight chance to pray on you. Uh, the, this is the family. At times the family is not so welcoming. But uh, I was lucky my family supported me through, all through. At times some of these families, they are not welcoming. The society does not even want to see you. You will even hear some parents just telling those persons that do not get yourself close to this lady, she has bad influence. So there is that stigma that, and it is a bad one. The church where you're supposed to go and seek solace, and there, some churches cannot accommodate you because of your past. It is, now that is where the reality starts hitting you. Where do you begin? Where do you start by? Because for one, when you're living in prison, you do not have even a single cent to begin your life with. You have absolutely nothing. Nothing. They do not even have that fear to take them back to the village where they come from. They do not have food. You see, those are the basic things that they lack. There is, uh, absolutely, there is a disconnect in reintegration in our society. I wish somebody or even our government could just step in or even these NGOs that they could just come up with a half home that when we, the ex-convicts, just leave that place, if at all your family is not supportive enough or it's not willing to accommodate you back, they can give you a place that they can give, even if it's just for a month, a place that you can just go and strategize your life. People have been released and uh, just as they are going back home, stranded in towns, or even you went to seek uh, help from a passerby in town. Help me, I have no food. That person thinks that you are a con and you're taken to the, uh, they call police for you and you're taken back to the prison. So I wish there was a policy. I wish we can do something to bridge that gap. I wish well wishers, people of goodwill, people who want to get rid of this. Because I believe most of the people, like 90% of the persons who leave prisons, they leave that place changed. Personally, I have suffered the blow. I was working for someone in a certain school and uh, I got, the, I, I just felt like I should open up about my past so that at least I can be given a chance to mentor these children that were there, the students. And that is how I lost my job after just opening up and telling them my past. That is how, so those are the things that we face as ex-convicts. So when I, when I joined, uh, when I was given an admission, I joined Nyakembe Girls in 2012. Immediately after my release, I think I stayed home just for two months. And I, now I went back to school and I got back there in form two. So when I got there, something weird used to happen. I would pass by and the students would just look at me so at the back of my mind, I, I used to ask myself, am I really too big? Or what is this that I'm really, oh, okay, what is this that I have that is causing the fuss? Until the Saturday that followed and uh, after I washed my clothes, a certain lady was just there and I asked her, really, what happened? Uh, the other day I passed by your class and everybody was looking at me, what is wrong? She told me, ah, the principal was that told us so much about you. So when people, you came and you told us who you are and the, for your former school, we just knew you were the one. So the principal told us that you have a baby at home, you are from prison. So you can imagine how crushed I was. I lost, I, it was really, really, really bad. I felt bad. Really, how do you, do you, you even get the guts to tell students like these are teens? And me, I was already past that. So, could imagine that now the task that was ahead of me dealing with these teens, a multitude against one. So, here yeah, I am. I, I, I remember, like, for instance, there was a time I went home, I was not feeling well, and coming back to school, I met all my books have been torn. And my locker on top of it was written non-virgin. Of course, I was not a virgin. I was a mother. But it is still hard. Like, where do you even get the courage to tell someone like that? 
at times I would just go to sleep, and especially when I joined the school leadership as a captain, I would just get back to, to go to the dormitory, I've gone to sleep, and my bed, it's so wet. Somebody just went there, poured water in my bed, and just made it so well. At times I would just go get stinging netto in my in my clothes. It was okay. Those students they really tried me to their best of their knowledge. They did something, everything to provoke me. But I had two friends in that school. My class teacher, Mr. Njuguna, and the then deputy principal, Madam Wai. She was more she was more of a mother to me than of a teacher. She would just encourage me and tell me one thing, Beatrice, just perform. Be a good, perform, perform, give them good grades and shut their mouths. And I thank God because even after spending four years away from school, and even after spending three, uh, three, uh, or three and a half years in prison, God gave me the grace and I used to perform well. I think the least grade I ever took home was a B minus. Uh, and I remember, even my going back to school, it was not so easy. As I had said earlier, the financial constraint and my family could not have taken me back to school. So I went to the drawing board. I called my Christine and like, Christine, me, I want to go back to school. I have no school fees and I don't. She, said, she told me, come to our office. I went to South B in the offices. I filled, a, I requested for a scholarship and wow, they awarded me a full scholarship back to school. That is, I owe who I am, my education and my success today to Faraja Foundation. They believed in me and I am sure I gave them the best. When uh, the bullying became so much for me, I left Nyakambi for, the, for my own interest. I left the school and enrolled uh, as a private candidate. And I wrote secondary, that's why I did my KCSE. And... Um, well, to me, that I tried. I really tried. Scoring a beam as a private student, a mother, and struggling the life here outside, I think I gave it my best shot. And uh, I got an admission to Kenyatta University. I'm doing my Bachelor of Education, and I'm almost done. And I thank God, because there were dreams that I had. They have taken time to be realized, but at the end of the day, I'm happy with the progress that I'm making with my own life. I believe most of these problems that we are experiencing right now, they are, they are coming from right from our families. This is a place that we see so many failures are coming from there. As a family set up, I think it's the high time that we took family seriously. Let's not leave parenting. Parents, we as parents, our children are not interested in the presents that we are going to give them. They are interested in our presence, being there for them, hearing them out. Yeah, stop just delegating those duties to someone else. These are children for crying out loud. This part, if this child succeeds in life, it is your success as a parent. If this child fails in life, it is a shame as a parent. When I was incarcerated and my mom, took my son at a given time my, my mom fell ill and my sister my elder sister took in my son uh, together with her husband I, I don't know even how I can repay them they treated my son as one of their own I look at those photos of their daughter and my son donning clothes matching clothes they took my son to a good nursery school they bought every. They treated him so nicely, just like their own. As a matter of fact, my son up to date calls my sister mom. Though back then he would call my sister mom and refer me to as Mama Nairobi. It used to hurt, but he had no choice. He had not known really what had really happened. So my sister, thank you so much, Pauline. God bless you. As for Priscilla, no words can really really, really much the gratitude that I owe you. I know at a given time, I really embarrassed you to your colleagues. I know I made you suffer psychologically. I know it affected you even in your, in your career path. But thank you for standing with me. Thank you for helping my parents, our parents, waiver the legal fee. Thank you so much. 
the many trips that you made to Langata Women's Prison, God bless you. My brother, oh my goodness, I don't know how to say about you, you are my partner in everything. Thank you for the shoulder that you led that to me. Not even a single time were you instructed by mom or dad to come and just know what I was going through and you failed to. Thank you for the many times. I do not, I remember at a given time when I gave birth to my son, you know, we were not allowed to have foods from outside and my brother would make it very early in the morning. By six, he was at Kenyatta. I don't know how he used to make it. With him was a thermos and some food just to, to, have, to let me just have that taste of home food. And he would just come, place it at another table there. And yes, I would know he eats mine, but he had to just come afraid that he was talking to the patient in the next bed for, the, for my own benefit. Thank you so much. You sac you've sacrificed a lot. And also when I was getting back to school, my brother bought me my shoes, my school shoes. His own, also, he, all of them, I've done so much. And when I got back to school, my parents never got tired of me. They provided everything that uh, I needed. Then they also played part in the well-being of my son. It is so sad, really sad, that mom, they cannot hear me at this particular point. May they keep resting in peace. But I'm so proud of them. They gave me a second chance. Just kill I wish they just lived long enough to enjoy the success because I know the best is yet to come. I know the many times that mom you had to bear so much as me, your last one, just taking you back to those diaper days. The stories I hear of you carrying my son to school, you doing so much for him. The love that dad showed my son was just unimaginable. He treats him as his own, the things that he has he set aside for my son, their conversations. At a given time, I even had to intervene that my dad, they were just there talking with my son. And he was like, when you get to a certain age, I'll take you to a boarding school. I'll make your life better. Just work hard, do everything. And then I had to ask my dad, dad, I am the mother of this boy. Why are you like put sidelining me and everything? Then he's like, no, he is my last born. I know up to date, my son, everything that he does, at times he does not even look how much I admire him do things, the things that he do. I know that he always benchmarks them with what my dad expects of him. He bases his success or anything that he wants with what my dad taught him. They've been with dad. He has, uh, you know, th those things, he, my dad instilled them. Those, the male instincts in my son. I remember that there are times my son could not go to bed without a torch and I would really ask him, what is the torch for? And he would tell me, Uka said, a real man does not sleep without a torch. Anything can come up at night. Uh, then when he, whenever he is walking, would see him just walking and holding a stick and like, what the stick for? Wuka said, a real man walks something in the hand, he might encounter something along the way. You see, like, he has those things. He has been taught how to be a man by the grandfather. That's how close they are. Oh my goodness. It is just... I, no, even if I say thank you to my parents, it may never be enough. It may feel somehow as an understatement. But just know that I love them so much and I'm grateful to them. The woman I am today, it's because of them. The person I am today is because of them. 
they never got tired of me like those many days my dad would come to langata and i would ask him dad nikikuja utanirudisha shule and he would tell me yes toka mahali hapa ndio kupeleka shule and surely he lived to that my mom another strong woman a prayer warrior i remember my mom has held us so close to her heart that even our final days my mom would really pray for us i remember even when that time that she could not even really talk well you just tell her god is good and she would answer all the time in a very faint voice so i know wherever she is she's resting with the angels she was a prayer warrior that stitched the whole family together from the whole experience 10 down 10 years down the line i've learned not to act in the heat of the moment i take time before i react i had to just get into a confrontation and just react to it i take my time uh, i ask myself is it really worth it so and i le- i learned to let go i understand that the, the more you have your, your bitterness the more you have those grudges the more you have those ill feelings within you you destroy yourself you destroy your inner feeling you lose taste in so many things your heart becomes bitter and you seek revenge but at times you just let them you just let things go let them just be you, at times someone appears as a fool but the moment that you forgive someone you are you, you release so much and you feel that the person who really needed that forgiveness actually it's not even the other person it is you who has forgiven your heart is at peace with so many things and no when you are at peace with yourself in the first place you will be able to co- to live with others peacefully again i've learned to uh, i've learned uh, to accept situations as they come by it's not so it's not everything that is worth fighting for uh then again there those times i've learned to accept to uh, appreciate those very little things life can offer you know somebody today might look as at uh, just something like a piece of tissue you, you know to many of us it may not have that meaningful effect in our lives but you never know what you are you never know what you've got till you miss it there those times that you just sit down and just realize i have got no tissue the person who can give that is also has no has nothing to offer and even if she has she'll just give you so little because she does not know where she's going to get the next supply so learn to appreciate those very small minute things life offers as you wait for the bigger ones the smaller ones that come your way appreciate them again run away from trouble wacha kujipika kifua that it a police it a police my friend wants those police come for you that's the only thing that really the cell once you become a guest of state it is not as easy as stepping out of that there is a procedure and a long one getting into it there is just by the snap but getting to clear your name and getting out of it it's just another thing and a hard one then again do not be judgmental there's those people who just think about prisoners and they feel they are people of a less or they are less humans than they are the fact that the, the only difference between you and that person is that he or she is inside you are out do you know that a prison is like a hospital anyone is a candidate no matter the degrees that you have you might end up you might end up in a police station and end up in prison my now offense is like uh, you just walk into somewhere you are driving you hit a motorist uh, and then you you are oh, my car oh my car you have hit my car i don't know blah 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 you become vulgar because your car has been hit and you are charged in court for disturbing the peace of the public you end up in prison what for at times you just think that when you like the big guy they are out you see people fighting you go separate them and ironically one of them is hurt and runs to the police station my friend you can easily very easily feed yourself in that mix and just feed yourself behind bars so those are just the very simple things that we assume 
when you are here outside and feel like we are we are better than them we are holier than them then let's stop this bashing with the prisoners when you see when you see someone whose case is really trading especially on social media i urge my dear netizens as much as you're using these platforms stop accusing people stop just saying those hurtful things i book before you tape that comments that you're leaving behind before you said something so evil about that lady about that gentleman ask yourself suppose it's my brother my plea to the government and the authorities concerned is that once we go to prison we have suffered enough once we come here outside let us not continue suffering for the crimes we did or the crimes that were associated with us and you're still carrying that burden give us documents affidavits or something to to identify us like for instance right now I'm in school soon or very soon I'll be out seeking for a job I may not even be able to get um, to be employed because I don't have a, a, a certificate of good conduct so like I go I applied not once twice I think thrice I, I was told that I cannot get one because my fingerprints are in the system so how am I going to clear that one how am I going to get out of that mess then there are these children whose parents are in in, uh, in custody they at times they need identity these people who are in custody they have been moving from one prison to the next one prison and in the process some of the identification documents they are lost so who is going to help these children are you going to let the, the sins of their parents just uh, come back to the children the stigma that the parents are having back in, uh, in the prison is still ex extended to their very own children it's not right i think we should just come up with a system that is going to bridge such gaps and in so doing we are going to create a better a better society a crime free society i may not be proud of the things that have done but i know only a fool waits to learn through his or her own experience a wise person learns through others people's experience i am here to give my own experience because i want to save that child who is about to make a bad decision i'm here to encourage the parents to have talks with their parents with their stay with their children to have dialogues because they're going to hold or they're going to help those children in their own future as we open up this woods heart but we need to, to talk and just heal the moment that you talk even your heart becomes you will become a tease do not live another person's life live your own life own your story for me i know i have that past it is an ugly scar but you know i'm not this gadget that i have the delete button i cannot delete it in from my own life it is there in my own life it is there to stay so i have to own it and i know that through my own experience someone somewhere is going to get encouraged someone who is about to do something bad will just change someone who is about stigmatizing someone who is going to change someone who is just looking down to someone because who has been behind bars change that perception we are good people the fact that we are pri we were prisoners they are prisoners they are people too we are ex prisoners ex inmates we are the people we are people too